All right, excellent. So welcome everybody. We're both honored and grateful to have Professor Larry Todd with us again um, this evening in our 2022 webinar series. Um, Dr. Larry Todd is Professor Emeritus in Anthropology at the Colorado State University. He's also a research fellow in Anthropology at the University of Texas, an adjunct professor in Anthropology at the University of Wyoming. Todd is a native of Matitsi, where he now lives, um, and he has conducted field work um, on the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains for nearly 50 years. Um, so we are completely honored um, and grateful to have him um, in our uh, webinar series and have him with us this evening, where he speaks about um, the culture collisions between wildlife um, and anthropology. So with that, I'll leave it over to Dr. Larry Todd. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here again. And thank you for um, hosting this, this talk that's coming to you live from Chicago tonight, where we're having the Society for American Archaeology meeting. So um, glad to be here. So I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen and um, get into the talk. And there we go. Move this out of the way. Come on. Okay, tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about um, sort of when Sarah introduced uh, me, she talked about me being part of right now three different anthropology programs. And what I'm gonna be talking to you tonight is sort of, I guess I could call it sort of an anthropological heresy. Um, we're going, I'm gonna be uh, talking about one of the central tenets of anthropological research, which is culture and suggesting that to be more effective at understanding the landscapes that we live in, in Wyoming and in other parts of the world, anthropo anthropologists, probably should be less possessive of the term and the concept and the idea of culture and try and expand it out into a broader set of research issues than we usually um, engage in it. So um, to, to start off, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on the archeology, span the anthropology I've been doing in the area. And I wanna to talk to you about archaeology as being sort of like a big complex puzzle. And Wyoming's mountain archaeology is a really complex puzzle with tens of millions of pieces that are scattered out across the, the, the mountain landscapes. And one of the things that makes the archaeological puzzle so difficult to try and reassemble, put back together, is well, first of all, off, there's no picture on the cover of the box to know what our puzzle is going to look like. But secondly, the archaeological puzzle, when it's on the landscape, is intermixed with pieces of all sorts of other puzzles, geology puzzles and wildlife puzzles and fire history puzzles and hydrology puzzles. All of those puzzles about the dynamics of the past are integrated into the landscapes we see today. And so trying to reconstruct any one of those is a really complex issue because all of the puzzles have parts that are sort of the same size, sort of the same color. And so it's, it's difficult to reconstruct the, the puzzle. And so tonight, what I wanna talk about is how research that we can think about or I'm not gonna give you many research examples of dealing with culture, more a thought experiment of what happens if we expand our definition of culture a little broader and think about ways of comparing um, culture. And we're going to define culture here, and I'll bring this up again later, as information acquisition, processing, storage, and transmission. What happens if we start using that concept um, as part of our understanding of landscapes in general, rather than just exclusively as a human characteristic? So the project the, the field research that we've been doing has been funded by a lot of people. And um, I always, this is my um, opening joke. Uh, given that we're talking about ideas and funding, 
Um, one of the things that I'm always talk to my crew about is generating new ways to get new sources of funding. And so we consume a lot of freeze dried food, specifically mountain owls. So a couple of years ago, my crew suggested that we start submitting our own mountain house package covers to mountain house, not so much to get them to support us because we support them, but as blackmail, uh, we start putting these crew photos of ours onto to social media and say, um, Mountain House, you fund us or we'll start putting these out there and people will see what a real crew looks like. Um, they might have got word of this because they've changed their packaging completely and that funding uh, idea is out, out the window. So we're not going to do that. So the, the project I'm talking about, the, the research we've been doing, we've just completed our 20th field season of doing archaeology in mostly the Absorca Mountains. And we call our archaeological project the Grable River Sustainable Landscape Ecology Project because of that, that idea of the puzzle I, I introduced. We're not just looking at information about the human past. We're trying to get a better idea of the dynamics of the landscape through the past and how it's changed and how it's come to be what it is today. So the mission statement of this project that we've been doing is to integrate natural and social sciences to promote, to promote ecological and economic sustainability through transdisciplinary research, education, and stewardship and initiatives. Um, so we want to study the past dynamics as a foundation for trying to better manage uh, these areas that we care about into the future. So in thinking about um, mountain landscapes, they're peopled, and I use that term broadly, with a whole series of species. And one of the things that most of us humans who study these landscapes have done is we started out by building a wall that separates the human part of the landscape from everything else, uh, separating us from them, uh, separating culture from wild wilderness. And what I'm going to um, be throwing out here tonight is sort of the, the thought experiment of what happens if we start approaching the area by, first of all, removing that wall. And this has been fundamental to our project since the very beginning, 20 years ago, where rather than saying we go out and we study the archaeology, um, our primary focus is studying the landscape. And we see landscapes sort of as this, uh, this um, illustration here is indicating. Uh, landscapes are in part the result of an interaction between a biological component, the, the physical environment, and a cultural environment. And the way those three sort of big spheres interact, um, they're interacting out on the landscape right now. And all of those interacted on the landscape in the past. And as a result of those interactions, they started encoding um, records um, of, of the, the interactions into the landscape in terms of artifacts or fossils or pollen or tree ring records. Um, all of those things are encoded in the landscape. And so what our Grable River Sustainable Landscape Ecology Project has been trying to do is start off with that understanding and then try to figure out how we translate what's in the landscape back to trying to understand those past dynamics. So that's sort of in a nutshell why we've been doing work there and what we want to understand. We want to understand even though my training is in anthropology and my background is in archaeology, um, I want to understand landscapes rather than just the human past. Uh, this project has been, we've been able to do it only because we've had a lot of students, a lot of volunteers, a lot of colleagues have uh, been, been helping out for years. And so in starting off, let's think about the classic definition, the legal definition, um, as written into the Wilderness Act of wilderness as, whoops, back up, wilderness, in contrast to those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape, is hereby recognized as, as, an, area, as an area where the earth and its community of life 
are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. So that's sort of the, the legal definition of when we have a designated, um, designated wilderness, what's behind it. The other concept that I wanna spend time talking about is culture. And anthropologists have lots and lots and lots of definitions of culture. Um, an anthropologist, um, Krober, actually wrote an entire book on the variety of definitions we have of culture. But one of the classic definitions that if you've taken an anthropology class, introductory class, or an archaeology class, uh, that you'll often be given is Tyler's. Um, that culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits inquired by man as a member of society. So what I wanted to do tonight was have us think about those two sort of concepts, uh, the wilderness concept there on the left and or on the bottom and the cultural concept on the right. And one way to do that, like I do a lot of sort of things when I'm trying to compare words is if we create a word cloud of those, there's a lot of words that's in one or the other but the word that's shared, the concept that's shared between them is humans. Uh, that whether it's humans, culture is exclusively human or wilderness is a place without humans. Uh, humans are part of both of these definitions. And so some of the things that as an anthropologist, I would like to think about, anthropologists deal with um, groups of humans and things like that, interactions with humans. I'd like us to think a little bit more about that notion that there are vast areas where humans are visitor and it does not remain is actually, from what we've been seeing in the archeology, span a serious misrepresentation of the long-term landscape dynamics and seriously undervalues the human dimension to, to wilderness areas. And standardized anthropological definitions of culture overvalues the notion of human uniqueness and makes it difficult to integrate um, studies of human dimension with those other aspects. If your basic definition of what culture is, is sort of what I often refer to as the kindergarten scale of definition of na 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 na, we've got it and you don't, uh, you're never going to probably um, communicate well with other disciplines. So many ecologists, when they're talking about landscapes, often talk about landscapes as if human, the human dimension isn't part of it. They talk about pristine settings and things like that. They, they um, remove the human dimension from a lot of the studies that they're looking for. They try to find species or areas where human impact isn't part of it. Anthropologists overvalue the notions of human uniqueness. And in terms of what we, I'd really sort of like us to think about, is ways to have more effective communication across these sort of disciplinary or research approach boundaries that we, we've often locked into the way we do things. And yes, it's true. Um, our wilderness area, our back countries are little changed in the last 100, 150, 200 years. Uh, you can see this photo on the left here that was taken by a USGS party in 1903, having a snowball fight, uh, same snow patch, uh, 2017, where I did throw a snowball at my dog just to reconstruct the photo. Um, but the, the landscapes themselves uh, are relatively unchanged. But when we start looking back in time, that notion that, like that photo on the right, that humans are not part of it is is indeed a fallacy that we're seeing from the archeology. span And so we'll, I've been researching this area fairly intensively for the last 20 years. Uh, it's an area when we started doing research in specifically the Washakie wilder, wilderness, only a single prehistoric archeological site had been recorded in the Washakie wilderness in 2002 when we first started doing work there. And one of the reasons for that is wilderness work is challenging to get to. It's also logistically challenging. If you're going to do intensive long-term work in the back country, it means it's, it's a very different sort of archeology span than being able to load gear in your truck and go to the site where you're going to do the excavations. 
So it, it takes a different sort of archaeology than we normally are trained to do. In terms of what we're finding in the archaeological project is um, bottom line, we find lots of stuff. Um, and we do, well, I started out talking about that pieces of the puzzle. We consider every artifact, every piece of chip stone, every flake, every projectile point, every core, everything that's part of the archaeological um, record out there in the landscape, we consider that to be part of a puzzle. And if we ever want to put together the picture of the past, we need to know about every one of those pieces of the puzzle. So we do what we call archaeological catch and release, where we document the materials and then put them back. So we're not altering the puzzle so that as people learn to deal with archaeological record better, have better approaches to it, um, they'll be able to learn things that we don't even conceive today. So as I said, we've been doing this work for the last 20 years. Um, as I mentioned, to, uh, 2002, the only site recorded in the Washakie wilderness, that red dot up there in that red blob, was a high elevation game drive. And other than that, there was nothing there. And when I first suggested that I wanted to do work in the wilderness, um, many of the people I talked to sort of chuckled and said, well, knock yourself out. Um, here's the map of what we know about it. There's no archaeology there. Uh, you're sort of wasting your time. During the last 19 field seasons, or the 19 field seasons after that, we've recorded a lot more. We've, at the end of the 2021 season, we've recorded almost a quarter million artifacts in the areas we've looked at on the Washakie. And that's not looking at much of it. Uh, we've only looked at 0.85% of the Washakie wilderness. And within that, we have found those quarter million artifacts that we've documented, recorded, and put the vast majority of them back right where we found them. So that's one of those first um, big uh, light bulb things that tells you that in the past, these landscapes were not unpopulated. They were not unused. Uh, if you think of if somebody has could do the quick math, we've only done 0.85% and we've recorded a quarter million artifacts in the Washkie. Just think of how rich the entire area is in these puzzle pieces that are going to help us reconstruct the past as we learn more and more about it. So um, in just the Washkie alone, um, the, the quarter million I was talking about is the Washkie and the surrounding forest. Um, the average density is 57 artifacts per hectare. And for those of you who don't think about um, space in metric terms, um, hectare is basically a square football field, 100 by 100 meters, or you know, roughly 100 by 100 yards is one hectare. So what we've been finding archeologically is if you envision the world split up into football fields, every football field we've looked at in the Washakie wilderness on the average has about 57 artifacts, not an area that you can make a case that people haven't been part of it. We've been, we do research that to every year plugs all the artifacts into the one cumulative database. And that's where this nearly quarter million year, year is, quarter million artifacts is. See some years we find lots, other years we don't find too many uh, and it, it varies, but they all go into one database that we're using to analyze the area and think about it. Um, in terms of time periods, we've got everything from artifacts that date to around 13,000 years old, uh, Clovis points to a very recent glass trade beads. We've got indications that people have been in the mountains um, ever since the ice first went, went out away from them. So it's been used not only heavily, but for long periods of time. Um, in terms of that database I talked about, on every one of those artifacts we find, those puzzle pieces, we describe 49 separate locational and descriptive attributes when we pick it up and then put it back down. So that means we've got about 10.9 million bits of information we've recorded on the archaeology in that small bit portion of the Washakie wilderness we've looked at. Again, this information is that background to why I have a tough time about thinking about wilderness areas as being unpopulated and not a place where humans have been part of. 
So all of these are those pieces of the puzzle. So let's take a little closer look at these two key concepts that I wanna work with tonight, culture and wilderness. And I see the integration of these two concepts as part of just that playing well with others thing that you need to do if you're gonna communicate across um, disciplinary lines. So what if we approach, approached anthropology from a less anthropocentric perspective? And anthropocentric is a term that means centered on humans. By the name of the field, we study humans. And uh, that's pretty much uh, the main focus of it. But what if everybody that focused on one species wanted to make their own discipline? What if we had um, ovidologists, people who, who studied sheep, and um, servidologists, people who studied elk, or um, canidologists uh, for people who studied um, dogs and, and their relatives? We wouldn't have a very comprehensive picture of biology or ecology if every discipline said that there was one species that was more important than all others in understanding the dynamics of landscape. So what if as anthropologists, we sort of opened our doors a little broader? And what if wildlife managers approached animals with a greater concern of cult with culture? That thing that we as anthropologists often take on is saying, our group has it and nobody else does. And we're gonna explore that a little bit tonight. And there've been some really nice studies coming out recently looking at sort of social learning um, in non-human animals. A study that was published in Science a few years ago looked at how um, animals relocated into new portions of the landscape, moved from one area to other, another, take years to build up an understanding of what a, an appropriate migration route might be. They start trying it out. They start passing that information on to the younger animals. They start, once they figured it out, by moving across it, that information on what's the best route to go from point A to B to C is passed on from one generation to the next. It's learned, uh, which is one of the key components of, of all sorts of cultural things. Um, and I, I got interested in this article on migration routes and learning primarily because I'm interested in the archeology span of things like this game trap you see on the right, uh, drive lines and um, artifacts associated with it. You start thinking about how that would have been used in the past or as these pieces of the puzzle, uh, recording these game drives. What happens when you're thinking archeologically about game drives as being a human culturally uh, motivated strategy for taking animals for food, what if we start also thinking about how the, how the animals react to these game drives? Um, and I bet when we start thinking about that, it really opens up our perspective. If you think about one year, you use one of these massive game drives and you kill a number of animals, you frighten a number of animals, um, some of them make it away. What do you think the probability that they're gonna follow that same route into that same game trap the next year is? Uh, they're they're gonna learn from that. They're go going to probably behave differently. And you're probably gonna use a different hunting strategy in that same bit of landscape the next year because the game animals have learned from what you've done. So rather than just seeing, seeing um, culture and hunting at high elevations as being humans learn how to hunt animals effectively and the animals are sort of the passive prey, um, taking a concept of learning and culture and letting both groups have part of it means that it becomes more of a behavioral chess game with each species, each group of species is learning and changing what they do. And the next one's gonna have to change what they do. I'll bet you that if you use this trap on a group of animals, it's going to be almost a generation's time until the older animals that experience the danger of that area, how you can use that one again. So it's probably not using these things year after year. If you're hunting in the area, you diversify your hunting strategy because it's likely the animals are learning from you. And we've been looking at that in terms of migration corridors and trying to understand a little bit about how artifact densities may move over, may change along migration corridors. And the thing to take away from this slide 
is if you look at these artifacts per hectare, here, 39 artifacts per hectare, 81 artifacts per hectare, 1.4 artifacts per hectare, and these are humanly produced artifacts, and we find lots of them along most of these migration corridors. And given that we know that animals learn migration routes, um, there's something appearing to be different going on over in this part of this corridor than the rest of it. And seeing that in the past, humans weren't also using this route, one of the things we're suggesting is in all likelihood, and some of the animals do occasionally drop down here, in all likelihood, the past migration corridor may have been a variant down this way. This area of the corridor is unlikely to be used by animals that learn uh, about things that aren't optimal for moving through today because this area is fairly heavily settled by modern humans. Uh, there's houses down here, there's ranches down here, there's schools down here. It becomes a non-optimal place. And so the archeology span may be telling us this, this part of the migration corridor is a little more recent with the lower uh, number of artifacts than these older ones. It's just one way that we might look at multiple records and start learning um, how they interact. So culture, um, trying to make the study of culture ecologically inclusive rather than exclusively human. One way to do that is to change that definition, that classic um, introduction to anthropology definition from it's something only humans have to looking at a little more fundamental part of what culture is. Culture is about information and it's the non-genetic information acquisition, processing, transfer, and storage. And we all do that. And if we use a definition like that, this, and this is one of the reasons I like this definition, is it can apply to other species other than humans. So it becomes a non-species specific definition of culture. So we'll, um, we'll start looking at ways that we might play with that a little bit. So what are some of the attributes of culture that I might want to look at? This is where we get away from the data and we're just going to do some, some playing with the ideas of culture and information. One of the things that I think is important about information is how long that information is stored in the, the group. Uh, whether it's stored for just minutes, uh, one individual in a group experiences something, it learns something from it, but then it's, it doesn't keep it for very long, versus information that's acquired and kept for very long periods of time. In the human case, we have information that's been around for centuries or millennia. Um, there can be, we can think of this as not being a, we have information storage and nobody else does, not as that, that black and white binary thing, but as a continuum of information can be stored by biological systems for different durations. The other thing that um, I just want us to think about in terms of this is information acquisition, this, this non-genetic information acquisition. How do you get information about your environment or about behaviors? Uh, you can get it in one way by experiencing something. You can be out there, you can do something, you can learn something, and that's one way to capture information. Another way is to observe or imitate or have interactions with others of your species. You can learn from doing, you can learn from watching. You can also learn from intentional instruction or um, guided instruction. So then those are not all the ways you acquire information, but they're just some of them we can start playing with to think about how we could put humans and other species on these continua. So taking those two dimensions there and putting them on a plot of how information is acquired from individual experience over here to instruction over here on the left on the x-axis, and then from information storage duration from minutes up to centuries on the y-axis, let's think about some of the critters that we can encounter almost any day. Uh, and think about this information um, on one axis and duration on the other one. So ants, I spend a lot of time looking at ants because they move artifacts around. And a lot of what ants 
acquire information about their environment, how they acquire information about their environment is just being out foraging, moving around, running into things, finding foods. So a lot of it is the individual ant learning things about its environment. But they also have communication systems, both with um, tapping their antennas and pheromones and things like that, where if one ant is out foraging and find something, it can come share that information with the group. So at a very simplistic level of information acquisition, storage, and transmission, we might even be, say, able, to, even be able to say something as simplistic as ant behavior, might have a culture at a very small scale. Other, other animals, for example, packs of wolves, um, again, learn through individual experience, they learn through observation, imitation, and there's also in social animals, some definite instruction going on. And rather than like in the ants where the information only be maybe only stored for hours and minutes, um, information storage in a group of social animals may last for most of an individual's lifespan. That information that it's acquired as a young animal may be passed on and shared with others. So we can think of of these sorts of, of species as having a little broader um, use of that cultural spectrum than the ants. And then there's humans who move along the world and acquire information from uh, individual experience, observation, intuition, in, in, in interaction, and instruction. And some of the information that we have, you know, most of you looking at this uh, slide show tonight, Remember, probably remember this image from the last century. It's encoded in, in your memory, it's encoded in our culture. But if you start looking back at texts that were written 500 years ago or architecture that was built and built a thousand years ago or the pyramids that were built and storing information three 3,000 years ago, we capture information about our surroundings and we store it for long periods of time. And one of the things that we do that's a little different than the other species is a lot of this information we store, we store outside our bodies. And that doesn't mean that other species, you know, by writing it down, by um, doing rock art on a face, by um, building things, uh, we, we store information outside our bodies. But that doesn't mean other animals don't store information outside their bodies as well. Anybody who has ever been out walking a dog and had them pee on a tree stump, they're storing information about them outside their body to communicate with other, other, others of their species. So the idea here is to try and think about culture in ways that can be continua, that lots of species can interact in this notion of having culture. So use attributes that allow integration rather than beginning with that separation. So we can think of like the ants, we might want to call those uh, species that have fairly ephemeral cultures. It doesn't last long. We can think of some of the things like the wolves and the bears and the elk and the sheep as having maybe transient cultures, maybe a decade to a little longer generational time of information being stored in transmission. And then you have the enduring culture uh, of humans. Uh, we, we can, I'm not saying that human culture is the same as everybody else, but if you plot it on a continuum, it, it comes off to the side there. But if we try and look at it as something that we can cross cut species with, we might learn something different. So there's our ants as ephemeral cultures, varieties of things in the transient cultures. Uh, the artifacts we record, archaeology, is an indication of an enduring culture. Uh, artifact I found out on inventory is information that somebody encoded into that piece of stone in this case, about 3,000 years ago. Uh, so that's an enduring piece of information that a human had encoded into a rock a long time ago. So what I'm suggesting about this notion about thinking about culture in our backcountry area and how that relates to wilderness is as this sort of fuzzy continuum rather than that distinctive one species has it and no others do. So in investigating ecological dynamics requires looking at these continua, these, these, these spectra of 
different species potentially having different uses of cultural information in how they use the landscape. So archaeologists, anthropologists, ecologists, and land management land managers all perhaps need to rethink many of our cherished concepts in order to recognize our common goals of really trying to understand how these, end, these landscapes work and interact and fit together. And as long as, as an anthropologist, I wanna view the world as a set of two boxes of us having culture and nobody else does, it's really hard to make connections. When you start your research, you start your perspective with A or B and nothing in between. So it's true that if we look at the dimensions of duration or acquisition, humans are fairly, they're at one, one axis, but lots of other species are out there as well. And so I argue to my um, anthropologist colleagues, um, all of us who have taken anthropology or taught archaeology, anthropology, often teach or take something, a class called anthropological theory. And I tend to argue in a way that um, makes a number of my colleagues a little irritable that we can never really have a theory of culture if we've only got a case of one human culture to look at. If we really wanna develop a theory of what culture is, we need to have lots of cases of human culture and all these other cultures to start investigating. So trying to break down this wall between um, culture and wilderness and humans and everybody else. So the work we've been doing with looking at human artifacts scattered across the wilderness as puzzle pieces is again, trying to break down that wall, um, trying to make us part of the ecosystem uh, rather than separate and um, masters of the ecosystem. And again, one of the things a lot of my colleagues often ask, or people that, that um, listen to this sort of rant that I'm having tonight, is isn't this perspective dehumanizing? Doesn't it make somewhat diminish humans and our capacities and things like that? And I'll enthusiastically say, yes, I sure hope it does. Because, and I don't mean that dehumanizing in a way that's detrimental, but dehumanizing and think of as thinking of us as parts of systems rather than the, the constant dominator of systems, uh, rather than being the focus of an area, we're part, we're parcel, we're connected to it. So I think of dehumanizing as just sort of um, not always putting us as being the dominant, the best, the exclusive in trying to understand how landscapes work. And so that's sort of um, what we've been trying to do with our research project since 2002 is work to investigate the evidences on the landscapes of these long-term high elevation interactions. Uh, we're doing archeology span of, in terms of reconstructing behaviors, not just of the human inhabitants of the landscape, but trying to get a better picture of how all of the inhabitants of the landscape have interacted and how those interactions have changed through time. And one of the ways we can start doing that perhaps is to start changing the way we approach this basic concept of culture. And so that's sort of what I wanted to throw out here as um, a thought experiment tonight. And I'd be real interested and happy to take any questions, thoughts, comments, uh, discussion about sort of this this um, probably somewhat wacky discussion that, that you've had tonight. So um, maybe we could open this up uh, and start talking about this a bit if anybody would like to. Thank you so much. Anybody want to dive in? Yeah, thank you so much. That was informative, inspiring, and um, you know, I'll say it fits in with our mission. Um, a key motto that I love to say is, when at the Bighorn Sheep Center through our experiential education where we take kids outdoors, you know, we are showing them that they are part of ecosystems versus, you know, existing on, you know, on top um, of them. They are a part of this. Um, 
So I have a few questions of my own, but because of our, our group tonight's pretty intimate, um, I think that we can just open it up to our participants to unmute themselves and ask questions. Dr. Todd, this is Steve Kilpatrick, and I was uh, curious about what you were calling stopover areas on the one slide. You had, I think, like the corridor, and then you had stopover areas, and those um, corridors and the stopover areas had the highest density of artifacts. Okay, the, what the, a stopover area is. The stopover areas is where the GPS color data indicates that the animal was there for a relatively extended period of time, a number of days, rather than just you know moving from point A to B as a um, travel corridor. So the stopover areas are where, um, when you start looking at the amount of time that each animal that has the GPS color data was in a spot, they're, they're there, they're wandering around, they're grazing here, they're grazing there, they're using the resources in some of those prime areas uh, before they move on to the next, Part of the migration. And so um, I really like that, not so much, you know, in terms of the wildlife perspective, it's interesting, but a lot of those stopover areas are there because they have key resources that are coming um, into their, their optimal um, use at certain times. And those key resources that are there for game animals probably also correlate real closely with a whole set of resources that are probably there for humans as well. So, uh, and the game animals would be part of the resources that would be there for humans. And we do tend to see, I didn't go into much detail on the archeology, span but we tend to see more of our large campsites in what the, the, the wildlife stuff shows as stopover areas than we do out along the corridors. We find archeology span along the corridors, but there are more scattered bits and pieces. They're more like a ping here on a GPS collar and a ping here and a ping there. They're not the dense concentrations we find down in the stopover areas. Well, a couple of questions then. Your description of a stopover area is exactly what uh, I'm used to. Um, so I was surprised that the density of artifacts was less in the stopover areas than within the category you call corridor. Corridor had the highest stopover areas was second and then outside of corridors was third. And also I find it interesting that uh, you think that stopover areas as they are defined today and as they have been determined today with a rather recent technology, you're, you're thinking those stopover areas have been stopover areas for thousands or hundreds of years. They look like they may have been. Um, and to go step back first to your answer of the different of dense, yeah, I ex usually we do in fi indeed find a higher density of artifacts in the stopover areas than we do in the quarters. And those, those blocks I showed you there, it was just a, an artifact of the sampling in those, in that the area that, had, that I had that block that said corridor also included some bottom area that has some stopover in it, it's good campsite. So it, it combined, um, that wasn't a very sophisticated GPS analysis. So rather than looking at a buffer right along the corridor and counting artifacts along that buffer, that was counting the artifacts in that whole large block of space. But if we do a more sophisticated analysis of buffering the corridors and the stopovers, the, the number of artifacts increases dramatically in the stopover area, the diversity of artifacts is a lot higher too. So it's not just larger number, there's more of them. Out along the corridors, you find, um, we find more isolated projectile points, probably hunting weapons along the corridor paths. There's a high correlation between isolated prehistoric projectile points and shell casings today. We record, you know, when we're out doing our archeology, span we record the shell casings as well as the projectile points, and you find those scattered along the corridors. When you get in the stopover areas, you find the, hide scrapers and the ceramic vessels. And in the later period, the trade beads, you find everything from the big campsites there. So there's different types of assemblages as well as the density. So you ask another part of the question and I got off on a tangent and forgot what it was. No, I think you answered it. I just, uh, I'm fascinated that the stopover areas that we're are defining today with today's GPS collars of uh, 
were probably stopover areas hundreds of thousands of years ago. And the reason I find that interesting is the changes in the landscape due to floral succession over time, i.e. conifers coming in, aspen going out, uh, you know, sort of willows going in and out, a uh, lot of the historic wildfires. The landscape mm -hmm. has changed fairly significantly, but I guess maybe that's been the last couple hundred years. Prior to that, well, it was a more- It's been changing quite a bit. And when we look at the artifact density, we're seeing a time averaging of that. Um, so we're seeing um, 10,000 years of archeological buildup. So some of those areas have, as you say, been timbered in the past and then burned in the past and then been re-timbered and then been open grassland. Uh, so we learned very early on, we developed a probability model of where to find our archeological sites. And after the fires burned through and we started doing um, archeology span in the burned areas, um, where before the fires, there was nothing there. So our probability model said that you're not gonna find archeology span here. We found that when you started looking in the burned areas, you found a lot of archeology. span So we realized that if we wanted a predictive model, not just of the most recent archeology, span but the long-term archeology, span we had to throw current vegetation out of the model because it has, as you say, shifted so much back through time that you can't just take it as a constant of, of what it looks like now and then. So um, yeah, areas have shifted uh, a lot over the last 10,000 years. Thank you. Fun questions, thank you. So Sarah, I wanted to sort of respond to, to your comment about talking to um, kids about being part of ecosystems. And one of the reasons I'm so um, adamant about this culture and archeology span and things is when you talk to most people about archeology, span it goes into that category of something that's really irrelevant about major problems of the world today. Who cares about what happened 5,000 years, 10,000 years ago on a landscape? But I think archeology span can be a great tool for getting to that point that humans are and always have been connected parts of landscape which for me is one of the key lessons we need to learn and get across to move a little better into the future, that we've got to get that connectedness as part of the way we view our, our interaction with the world if we're going to have a less sort of uh, negative view of what the future might be. And so I see this archeology span perspective of teaching connectedness as not just being about the past, but it's about the future. Thank you for saying that because that leads to my question, like what would be the implications um, for both the fields of anthropology and archaeology if more folks in, the, that, in, in, in those fields assume this way of thinking? Um, we probably need to start, and this is something I think all science is, is um, moving towards, like the National Science Foundation is now funding a lot of projects on what they call convergence where you deal what, do away with a lot of the traditional disciplinary boundaries. Uh, and maybe as an effective anthropologist in the future, I'd quit calling myself an anthropologist and say, I'm an ecologist that focuses on humans. Um, that, you know, like there's ecologists that focus on all sorts of species uh, to where we don't build that us them um, wall at the start, but we just try and, um, not have such siloed, um, shallow, inter single disciplinary focuses. So the, if I had a magic wand for education today, I'd say we need to start learning uh, about the world the same way Darwin did, more as a natural history perspective where you're learning about geology and botany and, and paleontology and animal behavior is all of trying to learn about the world. We've, we've partitioned tried to separate our, our domains of knowledge so tightly that even within anthropology or archeology, span there's numerous specialists. Within archeology, span I'm a zoo archeologist. I study uh, zoology. And within zoo archeology, span I'm a taphonomist. I study certain kinds of processes. Uh, so we, we've, we've, I think, got way down the specialization of knowledge lines that we need to find more ways to open the communication between our disciplines. 
completely agree. Um, and just to put a little plug for our, our programs, Karen, how many subjects do we have at Camp Bighorn this year? And they're very uh, varied. <laughs> so if anybody on this um, webinar has youth between nine to 12, send them our way because um, there is that diversity in curriculum that really contributes to this expansive no data set and knowledge set that allows us to, to solve problems in a, in, a, in a different way than we traditionally do. Absolutely, and make connections so kids don't think that everything's so separate, that the geology is separate from the biology and the ecology, everything's connected. So hopefully they'll get that. And another message that I really try to work with kids on is I grew up in Matitsi and it's probably pretty similar in Dubois that if you grow up in a place like Matitsi or Dubois, you tend to grow up thinking you're sort of marginal, uh, that you live at the end of the world. You wanna, you wanna get out of there and go someplace interesting. And I think the, the research potentials we have in this area of Wyoming are so overwhelmingly rich that we need to help get that across to kids from the beginning of, of people come to this area from all over the world because not just as tourists, but because there's things you can do here. Sure, you can um, go somewhere else and get your degree and be teaching at Harvard or Stanford or Berkeley or Oxford, but there's still, if you want some of the best research in the world, it's right here. Uh, diverse, lots of things that are on study. So that's a message that I really, you know, from my personal perspective, like to try and get across to kids is that um, we're not growing up in a place that's marginal. Um, Steve, is that your hand up for another question or was that from before? Uh, I think Emily had a question before me. Okay. Hi, yeah, I had a question. Um, I'm Sarah's roommate from college and I um, studied math and computer science. So I'm actually really interested in this predictive model that you were talking about. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how that's calculated and what goes into that. Maybe this is too nerdy of a question for this audience. Just let me know. But um, yeah, well, I'm very fun. Um, so our predictive model is, first of all, we gridded the entire Shoshone National Forest into eight by eight meter grid cells. And then within grid cells, we captured as much uh, background data as we could on slope, on elevation, on roughness, on distance to water, on um, solar um, radiation coming into it at different seasons. I think we've got for each eight by eight cell across the eight, uh, across the entire Shoshone National Forest, we've got 15 to 20 environmental variables recorded for it. And then it's just a rather simple, uh, is there archeology span also within that eight by eight grid or not? The current model, we don't deal with density of artifacts. We just do, is there an artifact here or not? And then we do a um, multivariate regression and put, pick the variables that, or, or have the, the equation predicts the variables that are the best predictors of whether you're going to find archaeology there or not. And not surprising, um, solar radiation, how much um, heat it's getting for plant growth and stuff like that's a big one. Distance to water is a big one. Um, slope is a big one. Um, roughness of the surrounding terrain is a big one. Distance to a confluence of a stream. So we've got a, uh, an equation that has um, uh, X, whether there's archaeology or not there, is equal to uh, you know, about 10 variables in the logistic equation and can give you a probability for each eight by eight meter square across the forest, whether you're going to find archeology span or not. So we started doing that model, oh, it's been about 10 years ago now on a small portion. Then we expanded our survey network and reworked the model with what we've learned now. And then we've reworked it, I think five times now as we've gone in and had more information on where archeology span is across the forest. We've incorporated information in the post burn things and it's, a fairly effective model. Um, and but it tells us sort of where we could, it tells us where we could expect to find stuff. It doesn't tell us why it's there. Um, and that's again, looking at the, the migration corridor stuff. Um, 
the migration data itself is another really fun set of variables to put into our archaeology model. Not so much the people were in the past following those game animals, but those game animals are choosing their path. They're sort of like doing a um, biological least cost pathway model that you do in GIS, where they're taking a lot of the same attributes we have in our logistic equation, and they're processing it up here, and they're using it about how they move across the landscape. So we can start plugging that, those migration data into our, our other ones as another set of it. So it's, it's um, as I mentioned, the first time we ran the model, we had timber cover in it, uh, because at that time, we didn't find archaeology in the timber. It wasn't until the st timber started burning that we realized that's just a spurious um, correlation because you don't see archaeology in the timber because it's covered with all that duff. Uh, once you remove that equation, you get a better, or that attribute, you get a better equation that predicts the long-term archaeological record. Um, as Steve was asking before, of areas that have burned in the past and then revegetated and been covered up again. So we're trying to get that long-term archaeological record. We're hoping as we find more of the puzzle pieces that allow us to put timestamps on the record, whether a site or a, an artifact is a thousand years old or 3,000 years old or 5,000 years old, we can start refining that model to, to predict where we can expect people at different periods of the time in the past. But that's down the road. I should mention that when I started this project in 2002, I wanted a sample size of 5% of the Washakie wilderness. And um, in the last 20 years, we've got point or 0.8% of our, of our sample done. So we're not going to get that 5% sample that I wanted to do the statistically really valid models in my lifetime. I think last time I calculated it, it'll be a 137 years if we continue at this rate before we get our 5% sample of the Washki wilderness done. So is that a nerdy enough answer for you? Yeah, no, that's very cool. And it sounds like very cool to go out and collect the data too. So it's all very interesting stuff. Thank you. Thank you. And there's work to do. <laughs> well, there's lots of work to do. Um, Lots I, of, we, everything we do, we find out that we know less than we when we started. I love it. it means we're learning something, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess next on the queue for questions, again, is uh, Kilpatrick. No, let me pass to Mike. I had some time. Let Mike okay. go. I think it's next up is Mike. I had Welcome a question back. on how the uh, hardcore wilderness groups like Wilderness Watch are uh, viewing your work. We get mixed uh, feelings from it. There's some people who think that since we're saying people have been in the wilderness and part of the wilderness in the past, that we're against protecting wilderness areas. Um, because we're saying, oh, people have been here always. Um, there's some folks that see that as ammunition for saying we shouldn't have uh, designated wilderness areas. And that's not the message we're trying to get across at all. Um, I'm, I think we need larger, more wilderness areas than we've got now. But I think to effectively manage the, those wilderness areas, we shouldn't try and manage them on this, this fallacy perception that humans have never been part of it. We shouldn't try and reconstruct a wilderness that is only there because the Native American populations have been both through disease and active removal pulled out of the environment. Uh, so I argue that if you try to think of wilderness as being a place without humans, you're really thinking about something that we have humanly created fairly recently. So that's a, a real paradox for thinking about wilderness without humans and with humans. So um, I just advocate or think that we need to incorporate the notion that humans have been part of it into the system of thinking about it, not that saying that humans were part of it as a way to eliminate the wilderness designation. Um, maybe the definition of it needs to be um, tweaked to say that humans, current humans, are only sort of transient visits, visitors to the area to help protect it, what it is. But past folks weren't. They were there big time, long time, entire family groups, not just hunting parties. They were there probably sometimes year round. Um, 
So I really like to envision management based on good solid data rather than a created fiction. So does that? Yes, that's does that, very good, thank you. Yeah. There, I had I had one uh, one comment, and just for the audience, um, the stopover areas, the researchers are finding that the animals spend um, ninety five percent of their time or more in stopover areas. So, you know, if they're moving a hundred miles, uh, the the distances they tr they travel the distances between the stopover areas several miles very quickly, but then they hang out in the stopover areas. So people kind of, I just say that so people can get a bit of a picture. The other thing that uh, intrigued me a little bit, uh, Dr. Todd, was the, the wildlife traps and not using them real frequently because the animals uh, would, would um, start to shy away from those areas. I hadn't really thought about that that much. And I think there are 30 some known bighorn sheep traps in the world and 18 or so around Dubois. Is that right, Karen or Sarah? Yes. So yeah, so now, I, now I'm looking at this a little differently. I had. I had these these visions of uh, small groups of natives uh, using those traps yearly, but they may well have. Uh, they're so close here in Dubois. I mean, they're they're you know a ten miles or more apart. Some of them, but they they could have easily used one trap per year or two traps per year and let the other ones go vacant, so the animals would would uh, become accustomed to to no disturbance there. But anyway. Um, just yeah, I think that, mind, uh, didn't know if you had any comments. I think that's uh, I think that's a, a good way to start thinking about them is that um, you know we think of like that Dubois series. There's lots of traps, and that may have been using traps fairly continuously. But one year you may use this one, the next year you may use this one, the next year you may use this one, and then the next year you may not use a trap at all, but you may use um, scattered hunting blinds along trails. Or rather than aggregating the animals, you might, if they're getting used to that hunting strategy, you might start using other hunting strategies. So we, we, when we start looking around some of the game traps that we've worked with further north in the Absorcas, um, we see the big game traps. I showed you a map of one of them. But then in the surrounding areas, we see lots of little hunting blinds, lots of little other sort of hunting features that may be the what you do on the years when the animals have learned not to use the trap route and use the other ones, you're saying, well, they're gonna be coming down over here. We'll have a intercept hunting thing here. So it's, it's that notion that it's probably a lot more complex than just, as you said, and I, I went into looking at the traps the same way you were talking about it, is that they were probably your yearly grocery stopping location of you go there and stock up on food for the winter. But if you start realizing that the animals are also playing that learning game, you may not be able to go back to the same Costco every year. So I don't have answers on any of this stuff. We're talking about the culture and landscapes, but it's the, the what sort of excites me about all those things I don't know that I want to learn. And um, in talking about the stopover areas, the migration quarters, that's just a new way to help me uh, make my models of thinking about the place um, more comprehensive and in some ways more confusing. Um, they're real neat to think about because I, I bet that humans, if they start using those stopover areas at the same time the animals are stopping over there, they're going to agitate the herds and they're going to have to move out of those stopover areas more quickly than they would. So if you want to be a human group that's um, being able to exploit the animals fully, you probably won't be camping in the stopover areas at the same time they're using it. So um, no answers to any of this. This is just sort of the, the thought experiment playing with, as I said, the things we don't know. What a fascinating topic. Um, and we're so honored and, and again, grateful um, that you would join us this evening and share this with us um, for during such a busy week for you. Um, so I think that's it from the audience. Um, well, I really enjoyed tonight. I got to play tonight, just play with ideas and didn't have to have a lot of hard data like I do at the conference here. So this was fun. This was a recreational talk for me. So I hope you took it as that for you. Uh, yeah. Let's just play with this. Lovely.
Um, and this will be recorded. So for the folks that we couldn't, if your friends couldn't make it tonight, um, let everybody know, visit our website, um, bighorn.org slash repository. Um, all of our webinars are recorded and stored there. Um, and we look forward to getting this out to the public. Thank you, Dr. Todd. Well, thank you all and thanks for coming and great questions, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Bye, Joe. Bye, Gary. Bye, everyone.